something like extraordinary happenings. So this is available only in Tibetan right now, but I'm trying to slowly, slowly translate this into English. And then uh, somebody could translate that in Hindi and also other languages also. And that will be very helpful for people to cultivate faith, deeper faith. Thank you, Krishna. <clears throat> Just five more minutes and we'll start everyone. <clears throat> Kishla, could you rewatch to end the Lydra Kashi Chigging Ali Gitan Shatanda? Kishla, you came like this must from Brutan Dalish. Kishla Yaksi Sarilish. Kishla, home Oh, yeah. Elizabeth, that's for you. You want to see my ugly face in disheveled hair? <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> a very old friend. You're looking very well, I must say. You're looking very <laughs> well. And it's always nice to see your face. <laughs> Especially on a beautiful Christmas day. Oh, yes. Good yes. evening for us. Yes. Yeah. Yep.
<clears throat> okay, Tashtile everyone. I think we can start now, it's already six. Mm. So welcome once again to this very fortunate gathering and for the fifth, uh, 14th time actually, right? So I hope we have more such gatherings um, and welcome Gishla. So it's, <laughs> it's very strange to look at myself. So I'm getting a little nervous. I'll just try to see you all and then welcome you all. Okay. So Tashtile once again, and very, very happy to see you once again on this lovely occasion of Christmas. It's Christmas evening for us, and some of you, it may be Christmas morning, and I hope you're all warm and gathered together. So, and thank you so much, Kishla, for being here and blessing us with your presence and with your knowledge. We look forward to your teachings now, Kishla. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, <clears throat> As I have been repeatedly saying that we all want peace and uh, happiness, and in fact, long lasting peace and happiness. And I also repeatedly said that long lasting happiness has to come from within oneself and not from outside, not from material objects. Although we do need material objects and facilities, but I'm talking about long lasting happiness has to come from within oneself. I was reading a book today, which was interesting. And uh, there is a paragraph which says, getting born it's like being given a ticket to the theatrical event called life. Just as when you go to you know, watch something in the theater, you get a ticket. So similarly, getting born is like being given a ticket to the theatrical event called life. It's like going to the theater. Now all that ticket will get you is through the door. It doesn't get you a good time and it doesn't get you a bad time. You go in and sit down and you either love and show, either you love the show or you don't. If you do, terrific. And if you don't, that is show business. So there was like, you know, beautifully said and easy to understand, meaning that life is like a you know ticket that will just let you exist. And how much you will be able to enjoy or how much you will suffer is primarily up to oneself, up to each of us. It is true that there are external forces and also internal forces that might <clears throat> contribute towards your happiness and also contribute towards misery. Sometimes it looks like that the, the whole world, world is bent to, to bring you down, to pull you down, to make your life miserable. And sometimes it is not just the external people and the world, but it is your own way of life and thinking which makes your life miserable. But most of the time we keep on criticizing the environment, the other people, and we, we do not know how to go within oneself and rectify those problems and situations. So by reading this many book, Tibetan scriptures and also many modern, very well-written wisdom books, they're all basically saying that the choice is yours. And you need to become the leader for yourself, as I always say, that you need to gain control over your mind 
so that without trying to change the world or the environment or the weather towards which, honestly speaking, we don't have much control. But when you face all these adverse situations, which is bound to come, it's a part of the deal with the life. Nothing comes value free. So therefore, when difficult situations come from other people and other environments, you should not get completely discouraged thinking that this is now the end of my life. With this, this kind of attitude, we fail and we fail miserably. Not only in the Buddhist teaching, but there are many people in the world who are in terms of financial success are flourishing and almost at the peak of their success in life. But overnight something happens, they become bankrupt. Millions of dollars are lost overnight. So many people, when they are not able to think properly, then they start thinking, okay, this is the end of my life. I lost all my 30, 40 years hard earned money. And then they really lose hope and probably die or kill themselves or whatever. You know, they really have a very bad life. Then there are others who although will feel sad, but are able to see that this is big loss, but this is then not the end of my life. I might have told you this story about somebody who built a beautiful, beautiful mansion. And that mansion after having completed all of his friends were visiting and highly praising him. How did you manage to construct such a beautiful mansion? Perfect, kind of perfect. So the next day when the family was to move into this new mansion, in the night a fire destroyed the whole mansion. Then his friends went to see this friend who lost this beautiful mansion and tried to console him saying, they don't feel dejected and things like that. But instead of feeling sad, the friend was like looking cheerful and laughing and smile, smiling. And he said, I lost nothing because all my families are intact with me. So this is the attitude, you see. And especially not just family, when you go into the core values of human life. And in fact, this was another reading that I got today, actually, where there is a line which says there are the values deep ingrained in our mind, which can never be lost. All those things which you're losing indicates that, that they are not your real values. It's beautifully said. Like friends you will lose, money you will lose, name and fame also lose, but your internal positive qualities, the real values of compassion and love, nobody can steal that, nobody can you know, rob that. And this will be yours, not only in this life, but for many lives to come. So that makes perfect sense, perfect sense. Because at the end of the day, when we face various kinds of tragedies, which is not surprising, having taken a life like human being with this psychophysical aggregate, which is so impermanent and fragile, and the change is actually a part of the deal. And change happens each and every second. So nothing surprising, nothing shocking when changes happen, un unexpected you know, things happen, nothing surprising. But then, as I said, the change could also be used for constructive upliftment of the spirit and the mind. The change also can be used for changing your own life for good and also for changing life of other people. So therefore real source of power and energy and happiness lie deep down within oneself. I think I mentioned earlier, just as the most powerful you know, energy is packed inside the nucleus of uh, uh, an atom, such a tiny atom or particle inside, the nucleus of that atom 
people, scientists discovered that nuclear energy, which is so powerful, is just uh, extremely, extremely unthinkable packet of energy. So just as you have this extremely unthinkable powerful packet of energy in the external particles and atoms, similarly, you have that extremely, extremely powerful packet of energy inside your mind related to what we call as the clear light mind. So that we need to explore and find out, and go closer and closer to that inner light. So that's why as a reminder, which I've told you earlier also, is that for Buddhist practitioners, meditation and mindfulness is so important because when we meditate and contemplate properly, we are really employing the mental consciousness and when you use this mental consciousness, especially if you're able to use the most subtle consciousness, then the habit that is formed, which sometimes we call it living an imprint on the mind. When you leave that imprint on the mind, which means when you use this very subtle, powerful mind and get your positive activities habituated with that, it is that subtle killer light mind which goes from life to life, life to life, carrying with it those wonderful qualities and habits. So this is how you get drive long lasting benefit for this life and for many lives to come. Other than that, the superficial spiritual practices like <laughs> verbal recitation or going around the temple and circumambulation, these are of course good. It's an inspiration, much better than nothing, but uh, will not have much impact as far as the question of real transformation of the mind. The real transformation of the mind is possible when you're able to understand the subtle realities like shunyata, the, the unity of the whole universe, the sameness of the mind and things like that. As I said earlier, there you see the, the, the harmony, not the division, which we ordinary mortals are so fond of talking about. Right? So therefore, insight into various aspects of reality like impermanent suffering, shunyata, interdependent origination, which Buddha started teaching right in the beginning is so important, so crucial, extremely crucial. So today's text starts with this verse, wherever the source of peace is seen, there strive forever. Whichever you have begun, accomplish just that first. By doing so, all will be well accomplished or else both will not be achieved. The discussion that follows this verse, not follows, but actually the verse comes at the very end of the chapter in this text that I'm reading related to this verse, the discussion that goes before this verse, it's not a straightforward commentary on these verses. So it's difficult for me to find out uh, precise commentary found in this. But to, to glean a kind of meaning from the preceding discussions between Adisha and Domdomba, I can presume and I can figure out that he is basically saying, wherever the source of peace is seen, there strive forever. Now source of peace and source of happiness, the long lasting peace and happiness that I already spoke about. Wherever the source of peace is seen, there strive forever. Now how, how will you be able to see that source of peace and happiness? Unless you use your intelligent human mind and explore in Buddhism, we call it the three processes of study, listening, contemplation, and meditation. Just listening is not enough. I have already explained this earlier. Just listening is not enough. You have to think about it for yourself. And then having figured out the truth of that teaching or that experience, then you have to meditate, which means make it part of your life. Now, this is not something to be talked about, but something that should be made as part of our life. So through this process, when you see anything, 
as the source of peace, like for example, compassion. To really see compassion as a source of peace, not just saying because he's always talking about compassion, Buddha spoke about compassion, and, uh, and sometimes in the worst scenario, when you are victimized, then when you are unable to do anything, <laughs> then you say, I practice compassion. <laughs> That's not very sound, yeah? Because compassion, I always say, compassion is really, really the strength, sign of strength, not sign of weakness. People who misunderstand that they, they think nonviolence is a sign of weakness. Nonviolence and compassion is not passivity. It's a dynamic force. And nonviolence and compassion will become a dynamic force active force, force in practice, only when you are able to fully understand the, the importance and usefulness and the relevance of these qualities like compassion and nonviolence. As I said earlier, for example, with compassion, if you are not just you know, repeating as I'm doing, if you, are, if you fully convince that the meaning of suffering is Sorry, compassion is how nice if all sentient beings are without suffering. There's the definition that I'm just talking about right now. But if you're somebody who is really convinced about the importance of removing the sufferings of all sentient beings, meaning that if you have that attitude, naturally you have this feeling of closeness towards all sentient beings. Just like as uh, Kamala Shila says in his stages of meditation, just like a mother to her only little cute child. She will do everything for that one little cute child. So if you are able to develop such kind of attitude towards all sentient beings, imagine naturally a mother who has this immense love for this child is always watchful. Her eye is watchful where this little child is going, whether she's you know, about to fall or hard and things like that. So she's always watching and ready, ever ready to help, extend help. The, the fact we are not able to do this towards all sentient beings is a clear indication of our limited understanding or practice or conviction of those qualities, right? So therefore nonviolence is not just absence of violence, it is active practice of compassion. It is a dynamic force. And this dynamic force, dynamic, this is a, not only dynamic, but the most powerful force, because you are able to develop this conviction of compassion and nonviolence through contemplation, through seeing the preciousness of human life, through understanding the need to remain in harmony and uh, in unity, without hatching enmity and division and separatism, segregation and all those stupid things, right? So that, that needs a lot of reflection, study, and practice. It will not come like that. Even for ordinary apprentices, you know, we need somebody to tell you how to do, and then you need to make some effort, physical effort, and things like that. And this is much more so in terms of spiritual mental practice, because mental, when we talk about mental practice, we are talking about something that is not tangible, something we, that we cannot directly see. And we are only addicted in seeing those things which is tangible, which is concrete and solid material. That's why we are going after material success only. And what is not within your purview, what is hidden, you tend to forget. But as I said, the real power is there in that hidden energy called mind, right? So therefore I've been also suggesting our friends to at least spend five, 10 minutes every morning, reflect within, and you will get some idea about the peace that will come from that inner reflection, which you will not get just by watching a gripping movie or going outside or enjoying a delicious food and things like that, right? So therefore, whether we like it or not, at the end of the day, so this is almost like my conclusion. 
So whether you like it or not, at the end of the day, unless you help yourself, nobody will be able to, I'm not saying nobody will help you, but nobody will be able to help you. They might surround you, they might console you, they might give you some money, but, but you are, when, when you are broken completely inside, nothing can be done, right? So therefore, we need to make it a point as an ordinary person, we need to make it a point, whatever may come, ups and downs in my life, my life is my life. My life is an original thing. No one else has a similar life as I have. So therefore this unique, original, not, not duplicate. Your life is not duplicate, it's original. In this whole universe, you don't have a copy. And which means you also have unique special power and capacity, which unfortunately maybe you have not explored. Without just exploring that inner capacity, you might have just, you know, degraded yourself. And you might say, oh, how can I do this? Without even, even making an effort, you might have done this. So therefore, from that point of view, the most precious person who can help you is not other people, it is you. So recognize this person in you, who at the end of the day can help you, not others. So therefore there is this important importance to recognize oneself, recognize one's consciousness, it is capacity for doing good things, which is the meaning of prush, the Sanskrit Hindi word prush, which means somebody who has the capacity to bring about this goodness, Prush. So wherever the source of peace is seen, source of peace means genuine peace, not facsimile peace. Wherever the source of peace is seen, there strive forever. So if you are a real individual or Prush or person in the true sense of the term, human being in the true sense of the term, then you need to strive for those things. Right? We all lo want long-lasting happiness. If that is what you really want, then you need to strive for that source of peace. Because if you don't strive, how are you going to get it? Without cause, no fruit can come. Just by praying, it will not happen. Tibetans have been praying for a long, long time to go back to Tibet, but it doesn't happen like that. Unless you really you know, day in and day out, unless you make concrete programs, you know, make effort, educate the younger generation, whatever, you know, all those things, unless you, everybody works, it will not happen. It is not happening, not only in Tibetan case, but everywhere. Unfortunately, people are not doing that. And that's why we are having all problems like the, like this pandemic. It's basically our own doing, right? So then, of course, when I say our own doing, or when, we, when I talk about going inside, deep down inside, this is important because much of the problem, in fact, the main problem that we are encountering is not necessarily coming from outside, but primarily from within oneself, from one's own negative emotions. So therefore, here it is pertinent to ask this question, why people are fond of doing bad things, not so much about good things? This is a very crucial question. And I think I dealt with this topic earlier also, maybe this time or earlier somewhere I spoke about this. So if you ask this question to the, to the, to the Buddhist teachers, they will say, because we are habituated with the negative emotions for many, many lives. But for me, that is not a very satisfying answer because again, the question can be raised by saying why we are for many, many lives habituated with negative emotions, not with the positive emotions. Right? So I found an answer in one, one book written by somebody who is quite, looks quite uh, well versed both in science and Buddhism. So according to him, he says, 
this life itself is not made for Buddhahood or enlightenment. Which is, I think, very interesting answer. The life itself is not made for enlightenment Buddhahood, but the life itself is made for survival, for surviving. So for surviving, what will you do when you are surrounded by all other <laughs> ordinary human beings? Then, then the, the, the immediate resort to success for the survival is using the so-called negative emotions you know, in order to produce your own kind, get married, produce child, you know, in Buddhism we call it attachment and things like that. You need to do that to make sure because the very purpose of life is to continue your lineage. Then anybody who, you know, obstructs your success and then you develop anger and hatred and fight. From there comes the famous science dictum called fight and flight response. So there's what, what I, I read before. That was quite interesting, quite interesting. But then today I got another, in another book, very interesting remark. I would like to read this. He says, let us call the collection of these forces within us that push and pull at us from deep within human nature. Human nature stems from the particular wiring of our brains. There's the scientific point, Rama. The configuration of our nervous system and the way we humans process emotions, all of which developed and emerged over the course of the five million years or so of our evolution as a species, coming quite close to the Buddhist teaching. Because the Buddhist teaching says we are habituated with this for many, many lives, which is not so easy as I said to accept. But now, now here he says, because the brain you have did not come from an empty space. It's, it passed from your father's parents and then forefathers and things like that, which in turn, you know, in turn originated from five million years or so of our evolution as a species. So you're getting, you, you have, you've been carrying forth that, that habit. We can ascribe many of the details of our nature of the distinct way we evolved as a social animal to ensure our survival, learning to cooperate with others and coordinating our actions with the group on a higher level, creating novel forms of communication and ways of maintaining group discipline, the early development this, this early development uh, lives on within us and continues to determine our behavior, even in the modern sophisticated world we live in. Very beautiful description. So you, you, are, you are, just as the Buddha's teaching says, that you have been carrying forth, both from the you know, brain science point of view and also from the Buddhist psychological point of view, you are, you are habituated with so many millions of years. And that is basically for survival. Now, having said that, although this life itself is not necessarily meant for enlightenment, but then the other writer, he says, although the body itself is made for survival and to you know, make sure that your, your lineage continues, but this does not mean to say that you do not have the capacity to become completely enlightened. So here, when we talk about continuity of the, the lineage, the family lineage, we are talking on a very ordinary level. But then if you go into the depth of the mind, he says, you also have the capacity to become Buddha. If you choose probably a different line of thinking, different line of action, other than the ordinary way of life and thinking. Because when you resort to a path of practice that aspires to achieve nirvana and enlightenment, then you are, you are actually living a way of life which is almost completely against the ordinary human way of life, right? The ordinary way of life is the more there is attachment, the more there is hatred, the more there is anger, then the life is colorful. You know, watch a movie. People watch so many movies because it's very colorful. 
the so-called colorfulness in the movie comes because there is attachment, you know, sex and marriage. And then on the other hand, you know, fighting and shooting and that makes the, the movie colorful. And the movie is a more or less depiction of our ordinary life. I mean, those things, the interplay of these negative emotions like anger, attachment, etc., are not there. Life is like luster, it's not colorful. And then His Holiness, the Dalai Lama says, it is true. For example, if you become a monk, then just by becoming a monk, your life, ordinarily speaking, becomes like luster, less colorful. But then he says, it may look less colorful, but it is stable. It's stable. The so-called colorful life, so many ups and downs. You know, there's so much drama. So therefore, when we talk about finding the source of peace, we need to distance ourselves from many of these useless dramas that we play in our life and learn to live a balanced life. That is the point, balanced life. Balanced life means in terms of your physical health also, when the four elements, four, five elements are balanced, that is called health. That's called well-being. So similarly, when your mind is balanced, when your mind is not running after 100,000 things that your senses perceive, when your mind is balanced, that's why when we talk about meditation and concentration, your mind is, you are balancing your mind. Your mind is focusing on one object without getting distracted. This morning I was reading some stanzas from Arya Deva's foreign verses. <laughs> there is a verse which clearly says, we are all mad. In the true sense of the term, we are all crazy and mad. And he defines this by saying, Mad or being mad or being crazy means when your the mind is topsy turvy, when it's not balanced. And from that point of view, we are all crazy, we are all mad because our mind is not balanced. At one moment, we are happy, next moment, we are unhappy. At one, uh, during one hour, we are happy, next hour, we are unhappy. And then, even within a short time, you know, the mind is chasing so many objects. And so, it's not balanced. So therefore, this whole process of Buddhist practice is to balance your mind and thereby balance the elements in your body and thereby gain both the physical and mental health. So there, only your practice can bring that about. You cannot be helped by other people. So therefore, wherever the source of peace is seen, there strive forever. And then when it comes to actual practice, this is actually, I have, ex I have explained earlier, whichever you have begun, accomplish just that first. And I repeatedly said this based on my own like observation. I, I should not say my practice because my practice is almost zero. <laughs> so, so based on my own reading and observation, and I shared this with you a few times, for example, if you good, become good in one practice like compassion, then you just excel. Of course, not for name and fame, but just, just you will shine out. And that will also make you achieve many other spiritual practices very, very easily. And I told you earlier the, the teaching given by Nagarjuna to, uh, uh, to, to, to the, the king where he, where he gives this whole, you know, teaching, which is published as a book. Then at the end, he says, you are a king, you are a very busy man. And what the teachings, all the teachings that I've given you, forget about your being able to practice it, practice it. Even a monk in the forest may not be able to practice it. But if you do just one practice, say giving or practice of generosity, and king, that king has the capacity to practice generosity, right? If you do that, you will shine out and have happiness and peace in this life and the future lives to come. And I've given examples by saying that if you're thirsty, you need to drink water, but not necessarily the whole ocean, right? So therefore, 
it's not just you know becoming jack of all trade master of none but you know on some of these important teachings like wisdom understanding shunya you know emptiness or shunyata and compassion if you really really concentrate and think again and again repeatedly and then develop some kind of conviction in the beginning based on hearing then gradually conviction based on thinking then conviction based on meditation you will really be able to not only help yourself but you will be able to help many many other people like in my case i said i no practice nothing much but just having studied buddhism for so many years and sincerely sharing sharing these teachings i was able to benefit many people nothing to do with my person as such that i have a special blessing and all those things but the, the blessing of the teaching itself so it really helps so therefore whichever you have begun accomplish just that first ordinarily speaking also you know don't don't make so many promises i'll do this i'll do that you know we all have these experiences you know and then you are not able to accomplish anything and then this this the so called deadline comes and before you are able to meet the deadline you will be a dead person and i have learned that not just buddhist teaching but based on my own work i really learned that so this days i make very very less promise and i try to do few things which is really useful and especially if you try to do things due to the lure of money <laughs> you are going to <laughs> break your back <laughs> right so therefore accomplish just, just that first because if you if you achieve one and this that is this is repeatedly said in shanti devas bodhicharya avatara and also in business activities also you know you you set priorities the less priorities not important the most important things you concentrate and do it that's really really important because the the if you are able to just do one thing properly even ordinarily speaking if you are able to do one thing properly and having accomplished it you get special energy that i've done this this is the book i've written you see and that that will give you like experience and especially energy to start the next project happily now imagine just like me you know i make as i said you know i used to make lot of effort and promises to start little bit start little bit then you have like 20 30 things projects that you have started not being able to accomplish any but anything right then you can't can't call your work as a as a success and for people with may also judge you as not a successful person as somebody correctly said you judge yourself by what you think you can do but people will judge you what you have done not what you are thinking <laughs> right so therefore whichever you have begun now here before you start before you start anything think carefully this is the most important thing whether i can do this or not and even if even if i am able to do this whether this is useful to do or not so they, they in this case also somebody by reading a book somebody there was an advice in one book which says if you for example start reading one book and then the first in the by reading the first chapter you didn't get anything then maybe you read the second chapter also and you don't get anything this still if you read the third chapter fourth chapter fifth chapter sixth chapter until the 10th chapter it means you are stupid if you don't get anything by first chapter second chapter then don't read that so what i'm trying to say is is first of all find out because this is from the purview that your life is short number one and second your life is precious 
Therefore, you cannot afford to waste it on small, cheap, in, in many cases, meaningless things. Of course, we do that all the time because the meaningless and the easy ones, you know, we want to do that, which everybody can do that. So therefore, see whether you can do something or not and whether it is useful or not. Right? And then through that kind of analysis, if you are accomplish something meaningful, it will benefit many, many people, not just yourself. Even if you just, just publish or translate or one nice article, say on compassion or say on how to deal with this pandemic, you know, how to get rid of fear and things like that, based on your personal experience, it is going to help many people. Right? So that's why normally I'm not very keen about these fictional books. Anyway, so whichever you have begun, accomplish just that first. By doing so, all will be well accomplished. This is what I was saying. Or else, both will not be achieved. What will probably means you will not be able to achieve anything in this life and in the future life also. Or for oneself and for others. So therefore in this, in this text, through the discussion between Atisha and Domtamba, first they again pay homage to the three Kadamba deities. And then Dumdumba praises all the great qualities of Atisha. And the Atisha also in turn, in turn praises the great qualities of Dumdumba. And the, the qualities they mentioned are really, really the superhuman qualities, superhuman you know, achievements of these great teachers. And then to make a long story short, Dumdumba seems to be a very, very practical practitioner, practical teacher, whose concern is always how to make all these teachings very simple and understandable to all the followers. So therefore, he's almost like saying, I'm really concerned about how I will, or how we can preserve this tradition, the father, son, the father and spiritual son tradition. That is the tradition from Adisha and then Dom Domba and so forth. So he was really like saying in simple terms and language, he was saying, how can we preserve this inheritance intact, the spiritual inheritance intact? There's, there's the kind of precise word he's using. And then the, the text is more or less summarized by saying that it should be, it should revolve around the, the, the teachings of the four, the three. You will recall that four deities of Kadambas and the three teachings of the Buddha. So three teachings, it, the practice, the inheritance, the lineage should revolve around the practice of the three uh, Kadamba teachings. And the nutshell of those teachings is practice of the six or 10 perfections. And that could also be understood in terms of the practice of the six syllable mantra, Om Mani Me Hung. Then if you read the book like called Mani Kambum, there are like volumes and volumes of descriptions on the meaning of the six syllable mantra. For those of you who have not heard this, I will briefly explain the meaning of the mantra Om Mani Peme Hum. The word Om is combination of three letters, A, U, Ma, which becomes Om. So this three letter, A, U, Ma, has two tires of meaning. The first tire of meaning refers to the exalted body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. The second tire of the meaning refers to the ordinary Buddhist speech and mind of ordinary people like you and me. And then the last syllable, hung, means to become one 
to become indivisible. That means the purpose of the Buddhist teaching and practice is to transform this ordinary body, speech, and mind into the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha and become one, whom? That means to become the Buddha. That's the goal. Om, whom? Then in between that, we have money and payment, which means the process of becoming one with the Buddha to become enlightened or Buddha is the practice of method and wisdom. Money, the Sanskrit word, which means precious jewel, which, which symbolizes the, the skillful means. And then Padma Lotus symbolizes the wisdom understanding, Shunyata. So through, it is through the combination of the method and wisdom that you will become enlightened. So there's the short meaning. But then the six syllable mantra said the meaning of the six perfections and so forth. And then in an extended version, the six syllable, if, if we are able to practice this properly, then the process of transferring into the next life Transference of consciousness can also be done through the practice of the six syllable mantra. And then stopping being born into the six migrations can also be done through the practice of the six mantra. So this 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 syllable, you know, six syllable mantra is said to be the the unique teaching for for the Tibetans. Normally we believe something like that, but but I think it's for all people who have that faith. Because Tibetans have strong belief that our Shivara is the special deity of the Tibetans, and this mantra Om Mani Padme Hum is the special mantra of of the Tibetan people, and therefore we say that you don't have to teach this mantra to any Tibetan; they'll just pick it up. Even the small kids they will be able to recite these things like that, right? So therefore. Uh, This is more or less uh, the main meaning of this uh, text. So, so I think more or less that is the uh, end of a short explanation of this text. And uh, so, so the advice that we should get is that those of us who claim to be a Buddhist in general, and especially believers in the teaching of Atisha, we also have some responsibility of keeping this inheritance intact not just Dom Domba and some of the Kadamba masters, <laughs> but we also, as the follower of these great teachers, we should also, you know, accept with happiness that we are also part of this, 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 this group that follows Atisha and his great Kadamba master followers. And therefore it is important for us as much as possible to read the life histories of Atisha and Dom Demba, and similarly read many of their teachings and then make it part of our life. So if we are able to do that, then we are also kind of contributing towards protecting these teachings. Protecting these teachings becomes extremely, extremely crucial in general, and especially today in this time of degeneration where the interest of everybody is running hither and hither for collecting material, you know, goods or whatever, when hardly anybody seem to <laughs> have the <laughs> interest in the, 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 the favorable conditions or whatever, you see. One of the verses that I read this morning from 400 verses uh, was talking about whether this this cyclic existence has an end or beginning. Then uh, Arya Deva answers this in a very clever way by saying, it depends. For people who take refuge in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, who listen to the teaching, who have you know, met with great teachers and who practice, for them there is an end to the cycle of existence. For others, 
there is no end to cycle existence. So again, it is an individual thing whether we practice or not. Some of the important conditions are there. The fact that we have, number one, normally, normally, ordinarily speaking, we say we have obtained this precious human life. But when we say we have obtained this precious human life, this does not mean to say every human being has the precious human life. It's important to make this demarcation. And people have asked this question to me a number of times. And I didn't have a proper answer in the beginning because the, the question, the almost like usual question that people ask is, Gishila in Buddhism, we say human life is precious. Then why the human population is booming? Why there is, you know, population explosion? So it was difficult. I just ruffled my head and then don't know what answer, you know. So gradually by reading these texts and also by thinking, I'm just days saying that not everybody who has obtained a human life has obtained a precious human life. A precious human life means a life where you have interest in this profound Buddhist spiritual teachings, where you've encountered precious masters, where you have the wish to do the you know, practice. So many things have to come, to come together. So in our case, we have this wonderful human life. We also have access to all these precious teachings, you know, these this, this books, you know, they're like priceless. Mine of gems, you know. But for many people, these books are nothing. They, it's, it's like a book that you show to the cow, you know. <laughs> Means nothing, unfortunately. I can't, I'm not blaming them, but it, it's like that, you see. It's my experience, you know, when you have some money, you have to be careful, you know, keep it safe, you know. Otherwise, people might, you know, steal it and things like that. With books, I don't fear. Nobody reads books especially spiritual texts, you could just leave it on the table for days, nobody will touch it. <laughs> so, so this is, you know, misunderstanding of which is more important, which is more valuable. And I, I see this almost on a daily basis in my own institute, Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. There are so many books, you know. People don't pay much attention and they don't know, you know. If they read, try to read something, they might get headache or whatever. <laughs> right? So therefore, those of us who have this interest in Buddhist teaching, we should count ourselves being fortunate and lucky. And we need to make more effort so that not only you will get your own personal well-being, happiness, but you are able to share this and help many people. As I said earlier, even in my own very, very limited case, I'm able to help a number of people. So you can, everybody can help. And there is the way to contribute towards the peace in the world, harmony in the world, right? As somebody said very pertinently, that before I was uh, clever, I tried to change the world. Now I'm wise, I'm changing myself. <laughs> So at the end of the day, that is the only way. <laughs> because unless you change yourself, people will say, what are you talking, you know? I've seen how you live your life, <laughs> right? And if you, if you sometimes you don't even have to speak to other people, if you behave in a particular way, live in a, in a particular compassionate way, it is again, luckily, it's all, that is also infectious. And in, in Tibetan, we have, even in Tibetan, we have a very ordinary saying, but saying which says, Mi chisil la mata chichil, chichil la mata chichil, la mata chichil it is. Don't, don't look at people what they say, but look at what people do. Right? So, so as much as possible, we need to uh, practice it. And then this is how we can make our life meaningful. There's no other way of making one's life meaningful, right? So that's it. I'll stop here. If you have some questions. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Kishila. We yeah. have Natasha waiting. Mm -hmm. Natasha, how many questions? This time 10, maybe. <laughs> Please go ahead. I'll send you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kishila. Uh -huh. uh, today, uh, let me see. 
So far we have three questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, the first one is, um, what is the difference between the enlightenment and liberation? Please give a simple, clear definition of liberation yeah. and enlightenment in comparison. Yeah, sure, sure. Liberation means when you have removed the seed of the negative emotions, and when you have achieved liberation, uh, you know, liberated from the samsara cycle of existence, primary, even for your, just for yourself, you can get liberated. Enlightenment, when we use the word enlightenment, the word English word enlightenment has so many meaning, but I suppose here, when you use the word enlightenment, you are talking about Buddhahood, right? So when we talk about Buddhahood, you have not only removed the seed of cyclic existence, but you've also removed the imprints of negative emotions. Seeds and imprints are different. For example, if you chop a garlic, then the garlic itself is the seed. If you don't like that pungent smell of that garlic, you can remove that seed, but still in that place where you have chopped it, still there is a lingering smell, pungent smell still there. That is the imprint, number one. Number two, when you get enlightened or Buddhahood, complete enlightenment or Buddhahood, then you, you, you become somebody who is omniscient, who knows everything, who has removed all kinds of negative emotions, imprints, habits, everything. And that also for all benefit of all sentient beings. Nirvana, just for oneself. Okay, but not necessarily everybody who has nirvana, attained nirvana just for oneself, because Buddha, of course, has attained nirvana also. But that nirvana is called non-abiding nirvana. The Buddhahood is nirvana, but it's called non-abiding nirvana. Non-abiding means you don't abide in any of the two extremes, meaning the one extreme is samsara, where you don't live anymore, you don't abide there. The second extreme is liberation just for yourself. You don't live there also because you have now achieved enlightenment for all sentient beings. So that is called non-abiding nirvana. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is um, how to make practices of reciting mantras, reading sutras and others lead to the transformation of the subtle mind? The most important thing is not just read it, but understand the meaning. And then see the usefulness of that meaning, of that mantra, that, that, that uh, sutra, or whatever you're reading. That's the way to transform the mind. But as I said, even if you don't know the meaning, but recite it, that will bring some kind of peace and it also leave some positive habit that also is useful. So don't think that, you know, if you don't understand the meaning, just reading is useless. I'm not, I never said it's useless. Its impact will be less, but it is useful. Just, just like take the example of like in the playground, in the playground, when your team is about to lose, then you, then you cheer up your team, shout. You're just shouting. It's like mantra. And that helps inspire the players, probably win the goal, <laughs> you see. So, so, so communication, talking, you know, positive or negative has its impact also. Inshallah, uh, I understand that the person asking here uh, was especially uh, talking about the subtle mind, transforming the subtle mind. The subtle mind, the most important thing is to understand the meaning. Because as I already explained earlier, in order to, you know, impact the subtle mind, you need to go into the subtle mind. When you practice, as I said, through meditation, not just through sense consciousness. For example, when you are just reciting the mantra, it's your tongue consciousness, right? But then in, if you, while reciting, if you involve your mind, especially understand the meaning, as I've already explained the meaning of mantra, Om Mani Pe Hum, then that will leave an impact, hopefully on the, at least not easy to leave imprint on the subtle consciousness, but it will leave imprint on the mental consciousness. Then that mental consciousness also has subtle you know and very subtle so you need to gradually go deeper and deeper thank you uh and the third question is um how to develop shamatha if it is very difficult for me 
I understand that the shamatha practice is very important, but the mental image of Buddha Shakyamuni, I, I understand that the person is using the uh, as an object of this meditation, the image of Buddha Shakyamuni. So the, this mental image is very, very blurred mm -hmm. and it constantly disappears. Yeah, but no, the first thing to achieve any success in anything, don't start with this thinking, it's difficult. Just, just right in the beginning, when you say it's difficult, it becomes difficult. So instead of saying difficult, you just, just like it. This is wonderful, I got this opportunity, just like it. Nobody in the playing field says it's difficult. It's, it's, it's the delight and joy by which they play and they, they, they don't get tired, even if physically it's very exciting. So similarly, you need to first of all like it. Then second, to start with, don't make it complicated. If you feel not easy to meditate on Buddha, just pick up anything. Normally we recommend Buddha because there is added advantage, but otherwise you just pick up a say, beautiful flower, right? Or even the face of your, your, your mother or your father or somebody you really you know, love or something like that. Because that, that initial practice is just for achieving concentration, right? And then whether that image will become clear to you or my, to your mind or not is dependent on the familiarity. Like for example, if you're asked to recollect the mind of your, your father or mother or somebody you very truly love, that face will come. That, that, that face of the father and mother not necessarily be near you. So that's why even the sixth Dalai Lama in his love song, he said that the face of my teacher, which I meditate never comes in my mind, but the face of my beloved girl comes always in my mind, even without meditating. <laughs> so you start meditating on your girlfriend. <laughs> so this is, this is just- yes, so thank you. Yeah. Gishla, please continue. So sorry for the interruption. Yeah, yeah, I've done. My connection is actually. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, thank you, Gishla. And thank you, Natasha. And please um, thank your friends, our friends in Russia for us, please, for all these very important questions. Now, next we have Jackie. Jackie, please go ahead and ask your question. Hello, thank you for your teachings today. Um, I had a question from last week. You spoke a lot about um, uh, thinking about emptiness in terms of other, in terms of phenomena, such as um, thinking, looking at it like a dream or illusion. Um, mm. Do you suggest ways that we can think about that for phenomena? Uh, and then how would we think about it in terms of the self? Same. How do you think of yourself as like an illusion? Where is the self? Just like any other phenomena, uh -huh. when, we, when we say this is like illusion, it doesn't mean it is not there. Yeah. Okay, it is there like rainbow. Rainbow is the best example. Rainbow yeah. is there from a distance, it looks beautiful. But because you are attracted by the beauty, if you really you know, you want to go there and then catch it, you will never be able to catch it. Yeah. So similarly, the so-called, you know, any phenomena, and the, your pertinent question is self. What yeah. is the self? Uh -oh. to, a, to an unexamined mind, the self is very much there, it's functioning. So conventionally it is existent. Nobody is saying that there's no self. But without being satisfied by this conventional existence, if you explore from the top of your head to the sole of your feet and try to come out so that you are able to pinpoint and say, hey, this is the self, this is the I, I got it will never be able to do it. No. So there's the meaning of illusion. Illusion means things don't exist as you think. To your unexamined un mind, you thought there is a concrete you know, person. But when you really explore, it's not there. I had one quick, quick another quick question. Mm -hmm. you might, um, a while ago, you said, for us not to grasp at things, don't think of things as inherent existence. So if you're doing that, if you're 
if you can sit for five minutes and not grasp at anything, what are you actually doing? You're not meditating on emptiness, right? You're just, is the not grasping a side effect of thinking about emptiness? I'm just not too sure what not grasping is. Is it reflecting on yeah, emptiness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you meditate on emptiness, you don't have any grasping. The emptiness, you need to understand the meaning of emptiness. Yeah. I've explained earlier, meaning of emptiness means having no in, independent inherent existence that you understand. Yeah. But when you meditate, yeah. when we say emptiness, yeah. emptiness is mere absence of object of negation. Mere absence. When I, when I use the word mere absence, meaning that here we are not affirming anything. Mere absence of independent existence. So, so you need to let your mind stay on that mere absence. You're not grasping and you're also not affirming anything. And I have given you the example of meditating on space. What do we mean by meditating on space? Meditating on space means meditating on a state of being free from any obstruction. There's the mere absence of obstruction. So similar like that. Okay. And the benefit of that is then, of course, the grasping, you know, which is the root cause of samsara, grasping, ignorance, and then its products, negative emotions, all will cease. There's one more question from Natasha. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kishila, we just received uh, as a follow-up mm. <laughs> a question. Mm. Uh, the person is asking, where can I study um, where can I study under a guidance of a qualified teacher in order to eliminate the imprints and the seeds of samsara? My suggestion is just just this this distance is not an issue. So listen to His Holiness the Dalai Lama's teachings. Okay, because as I said earlier, it's important. You can listen to all the teachers, but you, you don't have to say, this is my personal guru or teacher or root guru and things like that. Don't, don't make those fancy, fancy connections right in the beginning. So to be on the safe side, <laughs> because dealing with the guru is also <laughs> not easy. So therefore to be on the safe side, I have recommended many people just listen to his holiness teachings. And there is no difference in terms of blessing. D distance is not difference in terms of blessing, receiving the blessing from the teachers, especially like his holiness. So listen to his teaching and then more importantly, practice it. So many books by him and others are there, read that. Right, and then ask those questions on every available opportunity. And then gradually, not just his holiness, but sometimes we, again, maybe a little bit linked to our grasping. Sometimes we need to have our own so-called teacher. Then gradually, if you find somebody who you really think is good, and then request that person or, or even without requesting mentally, you can imagine that person your teacher, right? Thank you. Kishlav, you take uh, one more question, please. Sure, 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 sure. Nili wants to ask a question. Nili, you can go ahead. Yeah. You can you have to unmute. You you have to unmute, Nili. Okay. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much, you know, for all the teachings. And now what I wanted to ask is really, um, what is the distinction between um, if you really have sort of very nice relationship, whether it's with your relative or with your teacher, and um, you know, really um, you like them, etc., and attachments. I mean, why attachment in this case, um, which really I, I'm talking about sincere relationship with, you know, people human beings and uh, why is attachment in this case is is a 
disadvantage because maybe I don't understand, you know, the... No, no, we need to be very clear about a few things. One, the meaning of English word attachment. Okay, but when in Buddhism we use this word not to have attachment, we are basically saying don't be obsessed with anything. Don't cling to anything. Don't get addicted to anything. So therefore, not only in terms of your relation with your ordinary relatives and uh, teachers, but uh, the text clearly says, don't develop attachment even to Buddha. So that means attach attachment is not just ordinary relation, but you get obsessed with it. And then you, de you develop this attachment obsession, not because that other person is good, but because this person is good to me. my relatives as you said my guru my relatives you know they're also good then more importantly my yeah. they're good to me but, but maybe they are good because they are good no yeah yeah they are good but not perfect of course but then but then the main thing that i'm saying is you get obsessed you know mm -hmm. if, if you get obsessed that's why when some of our relatives or people who we like, when they die, we feel so miserable because of obsession, right? The good, of course, you understand as good, but no need to get obsessed with, don't get stuck there. That's what we are saying. Yes, <laughs> well, it's it's somehow, you know, the nature of the human being. I mean, I don't so, know. So, so now what, what we need to understand is, it's more or less nature of human being but it is not the fundamental nature of human being. Number one. Number two, there is no push button enlightenment. In the beginning, we'll all have, you know, we try to practice, we, we continue with our attachment and all these things. We fall and get up, fall and get up. You know, nothing surprising. This is the only, you know, possibility, but gradually we'll be able to lessen that attachment and the relation become purer and purer and purer. Because I've explained this earlier by saying, I've given a very clear ex explanation between loving, genuine loving kindness and attachment. Yeah. Or yeah. ordinary love. Because ordinary love, if you think carefully and see whether I'm true or not, if you think about ordinary love, there is a little bit business going on. Even when you say this person is so good, I love him or her, and you may not say anything more than that, but deep down you are ready to say that I love him and her only if he or she will love me. That is business. No, if well, it is, not all. But 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 it is if it is a pure loving kindness, not all true, because if, if it is a pure loving kindness then even that person reacts negatively, badly, still you will love. That means your love is not necessarily, again, completely correct, because again, some people, you know, they have this unending attachment, that's also possible. But in some other cases, it may be less attachment, but you have genuine concern. So you, even if that other person reacts negatively, you still love, so that is good. But ordinarily, when that other person behaves negatively, you also change your attitude. So that, that says a lot. Okay, Nili, I don't have all your answers, okay? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. well but every, every answer gives me another push to answer <laughs> to other questions and to contemplate on what you say. Really, thank you a lot, a thank lot. You, thank you. Thank you. So, Gishilan, that's all for today. It seems. Thank you okay. so much Gishla, for thank sharing you. your knowledge you. and insights with us. And thank you, everyone, for being here today on this beautiful Christmas day. So, happy, a very Merry Christmas to everyone who celebrate. And for those of us who don't, let's just re rejoice and delight in other people's happiness. So, that's it. See you next time. Thank, thank you so much. Thank Keep you. practicing. <laughs> Well, we'll be meeting next week on New Year's Day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so Norzen, you have to plan something, something. 
Though of course, His Holiness would say, just another day. Mm -hmm, yeah. But we can ask our Sangha here if we want to take a break or... Uh... <laughs> okay, we'll think up something that we can, uh, uh, you know, do and share with each other and perhaps, uh, you know, request uh, uh, Geshe-la to give us some kind of, you know, I don't know what, a blessing or uh, a special prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, New Year does mark, you know, sort of a change, a new beginning, at least sort of formally. And I think in these very, very sort of challenging and fractured times, <laughs> we're all looking for some, you know, sort of a new perspective, a new wisdom uh, that we can we can apply. Well, thank you very much all for being here and for Norzen Love for being such a wonderful uh, coordinator, host, and you know, in case you haven't, uh, you know, you don't know that the back end in our for our evenings are handled by uh, uh, Sering Namgyal who's, you know, on, on our screen. And uh, today you can't see, he has a wonderful sort of little, you know, sort of, you know, I, I envy the hair on his head. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but look, I mean, if there is any sort of, uh, you know, any, any, any comment or any thought that you have that how we can make the teachings better, or something, something that we can uh, talk about. I mean, I just wanted to sort of appreciate what, uh, you know, Nili said. And that it really is true that, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, shunya and, and to really understand them uh, takes, uh, you know, even very sort of advanced practitioners a long time uh, to intellectually understand them. And then as uh, Geshe-la was saying, to truly realize them uh, is a lot of hard work. And sometimes, you know, the challenges, and I think I mentioned this a lot last time we spoke, the challenge is that we are really asking someone to explain uh, a non-conceptual experience. And I think I gave the example that if you haven't tasted coffee, there's no way I can tell you what coffee tastes like. At most, I can, you know, you can taste the aroma. And... Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's very difficult. Uh, so what the texts really do is point in that direction. And you know, it's very interesting that, you know, His Holiness uh, embodies the uh, Nalanda tradition. And, uh, and a very important part of the Nalanda tradition was debate. And why was debating so important? It was because they, why, when you debated, you approach the subject very rapidly uh, from different perspectives and, you know, different points of view and a different vocabulary. And so if those of you who have seen people debate, you know, it goes like this, you know, the hand moves and that really represents cutting through the veils of delusion. And so you take one point of view today and then sort of two minutes later, you take another point of view and you debate it so that you keep going to the edge of 